Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. I don't know about you, but I like new things. Did you realize that that word new describes the kingdom of God? Well, we concluded last week by talking about repentance. And it's repentance that brings new things into our life, kingdom things into our life. If we're going to receive those new things, then we need to become a new creation. Well, with that said, take out your Bible, open it up to the book of Matthew and Matthew chapter 9. The book of Matthew and Matthew chapter 9. We're going to begin in verse 14. And there, there's something significant taking place. Look with me, Matthew 9 and verse 14. We see that Yeshua is there, but there's another group that joins him. We read in verse 14, Then the disciples of John, they came to him, that is to Yeshua, saying, Why is it that we, also the Pharisees, fast much? but your disciples do not fast. Now, fasting should be a normal part of a believer's life, a follower of the God of Israel, the God of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. In the Bible, we see fasting is necessity for growing spiritually and changing. So these disciples of John says, you know, we fast a lot, and also the Pharisees fast a lot, but, but you don't. Why is that? Verse 15. And Yeshua spoke to them. Is it possible for the sons of the groom? Now, notice, it's not the friends of the groom. If you look closely at that in the Texas Receptus, it is the sons of the groom. Now, I put a circle around that. Because we know the groom, the bridegroom, other, well in the, uh, other places in the scripture, that is a reference to Messiah. So when the sons of Messiah, that is his disciples, his followers, his servants, says when the sons of the groom, meaning his friends, but it's very important that we see sons, says when the sons of the bridegroom, when they are with him, are they able to mourn? He says, for with them is the groom, so they should not. Verse, verse 15, second part. But the days are coming when the bridegroom, the groom will be removed from them, and then they will fast. Well, that's happened. We should be people that do indeed fast. But as long as, in this case, the bridegroom Messiah was with them, they don't fast because of the joy of his presence. Verse 16. Now, he's going to be talking about the proper way to experience the things of Messiah, his work. He says, but no one uh, places a, a piece of cloth, we're talking about a patch, unshrunk upon an old garment. Why not? Because this patch, it will rise up from the garment and bring about a worse, a worse tear. That word is schism. Now, usually a schism is, is used in regard to groups being torn apart. One group being made into two. And he says here, no, if you take a, a patch for an old garment, that, that, that patch has to be shrunk first. It has to have a, a correlation with that of the garment. Now, what's he talking about here? Very simply. 
If we have that gospel, that gospel cannot, although it's a new message, we also find the foundation for it in the Old Testament. And what he's saying is if we take the truth of God, New Testament truth, and we don't put it into the terms, the right context, the foundation of the Old Testament, people are going to pull away and it will make a schism. It will make a tear, a, a group of people going into two groups. That's exactly what has happened. Why? Because so many of, of the church, Christianity, has not understood the Hebrew, the Old Testament backgrounds for rightly understanding the teachings of Messiah. And because of that, they took his words and put them into a new context outside the biblical backgrounds and calls the Jewish people to reject it. That's what he's saying. Likewise, move on to verse 17, nor does one cast new wine into old wineskins. Why? Lest they burst, that is, the, the wineskins, and the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are destroyed. Now he's talking about something else. He's not talking about the message, but when he talks about wine, this new wine, well, he's referring here to hear the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit cannot come into an unsaved person, into an old state. No, the Holy Spirit, he needs to come into a new creation. And that's why if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, all is new. And that's why it's only through regeneration that the Holy Spirit enters into a believer. This teaches a very important theological truth. First comes salvation, then comes regeneration. I receive the message of salvation. Then the Holy Spirit comes upon me and brings about the work of regeneration, causing me to live in the newness of life. It is not as though some peach teach, people teach incorrectly. The first comes regeneration. Regeneration is only the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot come into the old man. No, first, that person has to receive salvation. Anyone who is in Christ, he is a new creation. Then the work of regeneration can begin. That's what he's saying here. You don't take new wine, he says, and put into old wineskins. If you do, lest the wineskins burst and the wine be spilled and the wineskins be destroyed. Rather, he says, you put new wine into new wineskins and the two of them are preserved. The two of them are kept. And that's what he wants us to see. We are a new creation in Messiah, and we have an anointing whereby we walk in this newness of life. Well, move on to verse 18. Now, in Matthew, Matthew tells this account, one of my favorite accounts. He tells it in a very quick manner and we're to do the same. Mark takes much more time in his discussion of this event. But notice how significant it is and what's taking place. We've seen conflict and conflict with the Pharisees, with the scribes, because they didn't get the newness of his words. His newness is all founded. It is the revelation of what the prophets taught as well, what Moses foresaw that would be coming, but they didn't get it. Why? Because they had embraced the traditions of the elders, a new wineskin that was not fit for this new wine that was coming. Notice verse 18, a wonderful account. These things he was speaking to them, and behold, a ruler, now this is a ruler of a synagogue, a ruler, one of the rulers came and he did something. Now, this is quite shocking. This ruler, we know that he is a ruler of the synagogue. He is a leading Jewish official in a religious sense. He comes and the scripture says, make no mistake about it, the scripture says, verse 18, 
He worships him saying, he worships, but he says that my daughter now has died. Now, this is going to help us, this passage, in understanding biblical backgrounds. Something that a lot of people are confused about. We'll deal with it in a moment, but notice he says, my daughter has died. Realize that. My daughter has died. She is really dead at that moment but he says to her to Yeshua but come and set your hands upon her and she will live what does he understand he understands that Messiah came to give life as Messiah he is the king of the kingdom and whenever we speak about the kingdom we need to realize that there's a connection to resurrection. Without resurrection, new life, there can be no kingdom experience. So this ruler of the synagogue, he's come to the conclusion that Yeshua is the Messiah. And therefore, he is the Lord of the resurrection because he's King Messiah. So he says, if you come and set hands upon her, she will live. Notice what happens. Yeshua, same thing, not that he gets up. He is made to get up. Why? This faith. This faith brings Yeshua into a situation. His activity in his presence. That's why we need to be so careful to pay attention to all the grammar, the gram, grammar indicators. What the grammar teaches us. It stands out. Too many Bibles ignore it. The translations don't pay any attention. It should jump out to us where it says Yeshua is made to get up. What made him to get up? This man's faith. Continue reading. And Yeshua gets up and follows after him and his disciples. Verse 20. And behold, in the midst of this, in the midst of a woman, a woman having a flow of blood for how long? 12 years. Now, numbers are important in the scripture. Don't think it's by chance that she was in this condition. A flow of blood renders her unclean. She had it 12 years. The number 12, Israel. This speaks about Israel's spiritual condition. A flow of blood, unclean, Israel is spiritually unclean. Why? Because they have not received the work of Messiah. Now, in the scripture, she has this flow of blood 12 years. And it says, and she coming, coming to, the implication is to him, but from the behind. Meaning she comes in a very uh, uh, submissive, in a very humble, not wanting to, to make any spectacle, she comes with a very quiet commitment. She's coming for a purpose. She understands, just like this ruler of the synagogue, that he's Messiah, that he brings change, and she wants change, and she needs change. So the scripture says, Behold a woman, this one having a flow of blood for 12 years. Remember Israel, the number 12. She comes to, meaning to him, from behind. And what happens? And she touched the, your Bibles will say, the hem of, of his garment. Well, pay attention to that because I've done something. I brought, I said it here when we began this section, we usually do eight lessons at a time. And I've had this setting here, and you've seen it for the last seven weeks, but it's for this week that I brought it. And what we find is this. The garment that, that she is referring to is this garment. This is a four-corner garment. We read about it, for example, in the book of Numbers chapter 15 and verses 37 through 41. It says if you have a four-corner garment that you're supposed to put a titsit. Notice, here's the corner, a titsit on the corner. And the reason for that is that you will 
see it, you put it on, people will see it. Usually there's a blessing that's made when this is put on. You will put it on, they will see it, and they will remember that they will remember the commandments, the commandments of the Scripture. And what will they want to do? They will want to keep these commandments, do the commandments. So she's coming up, and she sees Yeshua, and he would have something like this on. And she came up from behind him, and she touched one of these commandments, one of these titsit. Now, why did she do that? Well, it's a statement. When you take hold of a titsit, when you take hold of a titsit, what you are saying, what you're saying is, I want to obey God. And why that is so important? Because she is saying, I want healing. And why does she want healing? She wants healing in order to obey God. That's the purpose. What did we end with last week? Repentance. Repentance is turning to God, not just for forgiveness, that's part of it. But so you don't continue in sin. Forgiveness means I don't want sin in my life. So this woman, remember, 12 years in this condition. She personifies Israel, and this foreshadows, this has a prophetic connection that Israel's going to one day come to the conclusion that they don't want to stay in spiritual impurity. They don't want to be spiritually unclean. And in order to find salvation, find healing, find the spiritual change, they're going to have to come to Yeshua. They're going to come to him humbly, and they're going to take hold of him. But in doing so in faith, it's for the purpose of what? Israel's called the servant of God, to serve God. This is why she does. So the scripture says, for she comes up from behind. She touches the fringe of his garment, the titsit. For she was saying in herself, if only I touch his titsit, I will be made. Your Bible probably says healed, but it's a word saved. Now, in the scripture, the word sazo for I save, speaking about Messiah. Well, this also has the concept that's used in a variety of ways for healing as well. She wants to be healed but she wants it in a spiritual sense as well, that she walks and lives in salvation. And what's the scripture doing? Make no mistake. The scripture is tying salvation in regard to a desire to obey the commandments of God. Here again, we are not saved by the commandments, but being saved, what saved her? She didn't do any commandments. What saved her was faith faith in Messiah, but she understood that this faith in Messiah implied she was taking hold of the word, the commandments of God. So notice what the scriptures teaching the reader. Verse 22, but Yeshua turning and seeing her said, be of courage. It's a term of encouragement he says be encouraged daughter now that term daughters always oftentimes used as the daughters of Jerusalem speaking about the people of God he says be encouraged daughter your faith has saved you now here again I would circle that word your faith has saved you saved because grammatically it's not in the normal construction. When you look at it, it stands out. It's the word say so k. Say so k is in the perfect. What does that mean? It means from, from that moment, which now is in the past, she took hold of that, she believed. And from that moment, and then now when he's speaking to her, and into the future, she will be saved. It speaks about an ongoing salvation that is, inter, that is not interrupted. This is what the grammar tells us by the use of the perfect. And he says, and the woman who was, was saved, meaning healed in this case, from that hour. 
Now, this story kind of interrupts the one that we were talking about. It began, remember, it began with this ruler of the synagogue whose daughter was dead. Remember that. He says, now my daughter has died. But if you come, you can raise her. She can be made alive. So now we go back to this account. Look, if you would, to verse 23. And Yeshua coming into the house of the ruler and seeing, well, there was a funeral going on. They had those, notice what the text says, second part of verse 23. They had the flute players and the crowd. The crowd was, was in an uproar. And what was this crowd doing? It was a crowd of mourning. So they were playing the flute, and it was a dirge, what's called in Hebrew a kina. It is a term for affliction. The flute's playing a sad melody, and everyone's in an uproar through mourning. This sad death of this young girl. We're told elsewhere in the scripture, she too was 12 years of age. Notice verse 24. Yeshua comes in and he sees the situation very differently. And I would suggest to you strongly that how we see situations that most of the time he sees them very, very differently. And the question is, who are we going to agree with? Him or our own perception? Our own perception apart from him is always, always, always wrong. He sees it right. So he comes into this house, sees everything that's going on, and he says to them, basically, get out, leave. Now why? Because what are they doing? I've already told you. They are mourning because she is dead. Now here's the truth. Do you think that father was wrong? No. She was really dead. But we're going to come across an expression, an idiom, that, that so oftentimes is misunderstood by the reader. Remember what we talked about. When we take things out of their biblical backgrounds, when we don't understand the basis for what is said in the Scripture, especially in the Old Covenant, or in the community that the Old Covenant was given to, I'm speaking about the Jewish culture, when we don't understand that, then we err and we have improper theology now notice they're mourning and he says get out why you ought not be mourning why he's come for a change now remember what have we learned we've learned that this leader of the synagogue he has come to truth what's that truth he has understood that Yeshua he's the Messiah what does that mean he's the king of the kingdom and there's a connection between the kingdom and the resurrection. And therefore, he expects Yeshua to raise up his daughter. In this context, this is all personifying Israel. We should expect a resurrection change to Israel. You know, uh, there's this, this one good friend of ours, and she's been in a church for a long time, and she says, i got to get out because her pastor said something. He says, whenever you come across the term Israel in the Bible, change it to the church. No. He thinks God's done with Israel, that they've been replaced with the church. No. This scripture says there's a great day of restoration coming to the Jewish people by faith in Messiah. It's going to happen, and we need to be ready for it. Well, notice Yeshua. He says, get out for this young girl, this young girl is not dead. Now, why? Because faith is happening. Faith is present. He says, but she is sleeping. Now, we know that she's dead. So why does he say that? Because of his presence and because of why many times in the Bible and frequently in Judaism, death, real death, literal death, is spoken of as sleep and it has nothing to do with the false teaching of soul sleep there is no soul sleep why do i say that every time someone is spoken to that's dead 
They had cognitive information. They knew things. They spoke. They felt things. So no one, this concept of soul sleep is wrong. It's inaccurate. No, Yeshua speaks of her sleeping because when you sleep, what do you expect? To get up. When you die, you should have a sure expectation of the resurrection. So he says here, in emphasizing this resurrection hope, he says she's not dead, now she's physically dead, but he says she's just sleeping because there's a resurrection. He's going to give an example of that. She says, but sleeping, and what did they do? They mocked him. They laughed him at him. And what does this show? They didn't really believe in the resurrection. And this is the problem when we look at the disciples and when we look at Israel, no one really believed in the resurrection, although he taught of it and taught of it and taught of it. Why do I say no one believed in the resurrection? Who went to the tomb on that third day? He had said over and over, we're in Matthew. Matthew's gospel says four times that he's going to go to Jerusalem at Passover, that he's going to die, having been betrayed by, by the elders and the chief priests and such. He is going to be turned over to the Gentiles where he's going to be crucified dead. But on the third day, he says four times, but I will rise again. But no one believed on the third day that he was going to rise from the dead. But he did. It shows a faithlessness. Let's conclude. They laughed at him. And when he had cast out the crowd, he entered and he sieged. He grabbed the hand of her and the young woman she was raised up meaning was made to rise up and the scripture says and this word this report went out in all that land what report that through Yeshua there is life for the dead meaning he is the resurrection and the life and unless you accept him and what he did on the cross, you are not going to experience the resurrection of life, but you are going to experience the resurrection of eternal damnation, eternal contempt, and eternal death. Read what Daniel says about the resurrection in Daniel chapter 12. So significant. Everyone's rising. The question is to what? Everlasting life or everlasting destruction, death, and contempt? It's a choice for you to make. Well, I'm out of time until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.